I'd like to call this uh, meeting of the Capital Investment uh, Committee to order for April 11th. And uh, we have a quorum. First thing that it will do is uh, to approve the minutes of our uh, yesterday's meeting. And so, uh, Representative Eklund, have you been able to uh, go over the April 10th minutes? Absolutely, Mr. Chair. They look fine, and I'll move the minutes. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes. And now, uh, our agenda today, we have two uh, uh, bills uh, before us for uh, informational hearings. Uh, we'll finish up today with House File 3187, Representative Lilly on the Met Council uh, Regional Park funding. And we will lead off with uh, House File uh, 3332, uh, my bill uh, dealing with the wastewater infrastructure uh, supplemental grant funding. Uh, a real uh, big issue in, in the state of Minnesota uh, is the, uh, the issue of wastewater and clean water and funding and how to deal with the, the, uh, the many problems that we are having and you know, how to fund this very serious problem in the state of Minnesota. And so uh, with that in mind, uh, we'll bring forth uh, former Representative Marty Seifert to begin the presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, Mr. Chairman, thank you for authoring this bill. We appreciate that. It's kind of a rare circumstance I actually testify before my former colleagues. I think this is the first time I've testified in the House this year, so it's a, a pretty important issue. And I think some people ask, well, why are you involved in this or what, what is important? And there's probably nothing more fundamentally important to human beings than water. And we talk about a lot of things in this building, whether it be roads or education or whatever. But, you know, how many people either went to the bathroom or drank water today? You know, unless you're all inhuman, um, I would say every single person in this room uh, fundamentally needs water. It's the, it's the basic need not want that the legislature should be focused on this year with it being a bonding bill. With that being said, what's the purpose of this bill, House File 3332? Um, and why do we need it? And Mr. Chairman, I know that this is your bill and you understand the need for this, but we have, uh, and I, I don't use the word crisis uh, lightly, um, because I thought when I served in this body, it was overused because in basically every meeting I went to, everything was a crisis and ended up fundamentally devaluing the word. Um, but I do think we are at that point when it comes to water funding, particularly for cities and communities in rural Minnesota. Um, we do have several programs that are good in the state of Minnesota when it comes to water, particularly the PSEG Point Source Implementation Grant Program and, and WIF Grant Program. But when we look at the um, problems we have when it comes to funding, they're just simply not sufficient enough to cover the costs of, of what is facing these particular communities. So what this bill does is it limits the amount that has to be paid by local governments for wastewater treatment to 50% of the total cost or limit the annual cost for wastewater treatment to twice of what the uh, Twin Cities metro rate would be. Now some people are a little surprised at that and we picked that artificially. I mean, we, we just arbitrarily picked that. It could be three times, it could be the exact amount of the metro, but a lot of people say, well, that's kind of unusual because the income uh, in rural Minnesota is less than the metro area, don't they pay the same or less water rates? And the, because of our lack of economy of scale on having the Met Council uh, running that as one system, um, even though our incomes are less, uh, our payments end up being more. So I'm gonna be working off this brief PowerPoint that's in your packets, members, that looks like this, it's blue, has the Coalition of Greater Minnesota Cities logo on it. Um, why do we need this bill? Because replacing infrastructure and meeting those new standards is extremely costly. Um, the current programs are great, but they currently do not meet the needs that are facing our rural communities. So we're asking for a funding partnership that's needed because clean water is not just a local responsibility. Uh, this water is everyone's water. This water comes and goes through communities. 
Uh, in many cases, we have extremely high rates on residents and businesses that will be choking off economic development. My testifiers will talk to that. Uh, particularly, uh, I want you to listen to the Albert Lee presentation because we already have uh, businesses that if they end up having their water rates double, triple, quadruple, uh, they're looking at heading out of here. Uh, so this is an economic development issue. This isn't just about making a little old lady pay four times more than what she's paying right now. Uh, this is about making some of their larger businesses pay more and they've got brighter pastures across the road where they can go in Iowa. Um, cities are not the only cause of pollution, yet they are disproportionately paying for it. The next slide I'm going to refer to is what I call the regulatory tsunami. Um, we have in the state of Minnesota uh, a variety of new rules that have been promulgated since I left the legislature in 2010 related to phosphorus for lakes and rivers, mainly finished in 2014, the wild rice sulfate standard, which many of you have heard about, uh, that's working its way through the legislature, the chloride standard, which um, if you take a look at other states like Missouri and Iowa, they went to EPA type standards. Minnesota, of course, went above and beyond that, and that is adding a lot of costs. So the folks that are sitting behind me in these small rural communities uh, are facing millions of dollars of additional costs because of chloride standards that are above and beyond what our neighboring states to the south are doing. Uh, we have the mercury problem up in the Iron Range cities. Even though it is not being caused in communities like Gilbert, it's coming out of the air. We don't know if it's coming down from rain in Canada or eventually through China or where it's coming from. But we're asking small communities like Gilbert to pay the cost of mercury that's coming from other places. Anti-degradation standards, nitrates are coming down the road. And it's every single year um, we have what is the mother of all unfunded mandates. And I know this legislature on both sides of the aisle has talked in the past about we don't like unfunded mandates. And many of you come from local government. I look around this room. We have a former mayor of Lakeshore. We have a former county commissioner in, in Aitken County uh, sitting over here, a former mayor of Champlin sitting over here. You know what unfunded mandates do is they cause you to cut services, uh, raise water rates, um, or uh, reduce spending on something else and reduce services. So uh, this is the mother of unfunded mandates, members. Um, next slide. Uh, in 2015, uh, CGMC asked for and the legislature funded a bar engineering report. I would ask you to take a look at it, although it's hundreds and hundreds of pages. Um, it covers current and future water quality standards and stormwater costs. It was a wake-up call. It was a wonderful and excellent study. 15 cities around the state, Albert Lee was one of those. Um, it's not the same as the needs assessment used by the MPCA. Uh, the next uh, slide says it analyzed only 15 greater Minnesota cities, but it talked about $400 million for upgrading facilities. It talked about nine of the cities having annual rate jumps of $500 a year where the metro average is 274. Um, think about Albert Lee when they come up and they testify. Uh, think about Austin. Uh, they are another case where there's some very extreme circumstances of large costs. Additional 7.9 billion in stormwater costs over 25 years averages out to 317 million a year. Um, the next slide, we're just gonna talk just for a moment about unreasonable implementation. Uh, we have to work together to have reasonable implementation of standards. Nobody on the right mind on either side of the aisle is talking about getting rid of water standards or not having clean water. Um, we are gonna have people on one side of the aisle say, I don't wanna spend any money on a bonding bill. We're gonna have people on the other side of the aisle say, I don't wanna change any regulation, no matter how ridiculous it is. The small groups on each extremes are gonna to have to be told that we're gonna to have to probably do both. We're probably gonna to have to have a robust bonding bill when it comes to clean water, and we're gonna to have to have some moderate changes on regulations that make sense. If we're gonna make this state work when it comes to clean water, both sides are gonna to have to give, both when it comes to funding and on regulatory relief. I'm gonna give you a couple examples. On Osakis, a city of less than 2,000 people, there's been discussion of forcing them to do $11 million plant to reduce phosphorus, one one thousandth of 1% in Lake Osakis. Now, after our organization threatens litigation and contested case hearings and on and on and on, then the PCA comes in and says, well, we want to work with you a little bit. Um, we're going to have to have upfront cooperation, not on the back end after you're threatened with, with litigation and, and lawsuits and contested case proceedings. We have to think outside the box, and we're hoping that happens in, in Alexandria as well. Yeah, and the PCA is working with us on that. Little Falls, $11 million for 1% phosphorus load reduction. Rochester was one of the uh, cities 
that was in the bar engineering study, $210 million for phosphorus load reduction for a 2% reduction in Lake Zumbro or 1% Mississippi River reduction. Uh, Rochester actually had its own engineers uh, looking at the regulations compared to the bar report and said they were about double of what they thought the bar report was. So that was a very conservative report. We also have discussion of Minnesota River Basin down in Mankato and the Red River Basin up in the northwest which flows into Canada. So in summary, we are asking for your help for these greater Minnesota cities and we are going to have uh, three testifiers, or at least three testifiers representing three communities come forward and talk about that. To the bill itself, we do have uh, a summary of the bill on one side and a case study of Little Falls if you want to take a look at how this would be implemented. So if the chairman's bill gets funded at a certain amount, um, this talks about how they would be helped uh, as a community, there's uh, you know a lot of people ask mechanically how would this work. So I thought this would be good just to run it through the grist mill uh, on one particular case. We have a letter in your packet from Rochester. This is from Gary Newman, who was their city administrator. I'm sure Representative Salk and Representative Pearson know Gary. Um, universally respected guy who just retired. This talks a little bit about um, kind of the cost benefit of, of Rochester's extremely expensive uh, process. Another handout in your packet has uh, a series of the bar report cities and how much it's going to cost. Um, this mainly relates to uh, future costs that are being posed, imposed upon them. So with that, Mr. Chair, I uh, like virtue and brevity. I'm going to be virtuous today and end. Uh, and I'm going to turn uh, the testimony over to Kelly uh, Rashi, the city administrator of Lakefield. Keep in mind this is a city of less than 1,700 people, which is being required to build a 22 million dollar plant. Um, some of you are mayors, councilmen, um, you're all basic human beings with common sense. I want you to think about that if you were the mayor and the city clerk of Lakefield, um, how you would try to figure out paying for this plant. Um, we have Chad Adams, the city administrator of Albert Lee, and then we also have Mark Larson and uh, Mylan Alexander from uh, the city of Glencoe. So I'm going to turn the testimony over to them. And while they're coming up, I just want to draw attention to the last handout, which is the city of Osaka's um, example, less than 2,000 people, $11 million upgrade. Um, it was discussed that if we went out and shot a couple deer in the watershed every year, it would have as much of an impact as this $11 million plant would. So we just all have to kind of think about your regulatory oversight, funding oversight, uh, and our responsibility. We think the pension bill is a big deal. Um, that pales in contrast to what type of dollars we're talking about in the long term. So with that I'm going to turn it over uh, to, to Kelly. Mr. Seifert, before you turn it over, there are a couple of questions of you. Sure. Uh, Representative Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, uh, Mr. Seifert, Representative Seifert, thank you very much. I think you gave a very good explanation. And I'm Assuming we're going to have uh, some cities that give those stories, but a uh, very brief comment, Mr. Chair. I want to just punctuate this. We're having a hearing on spending tens of millions of dollars on taxpayer money uh, because of water standards that, as Mr. Seifert said, far surpasses other states, surpasses what the EPA is asking for. And I'll give you two quick examples that I'm sure you're going to hear more of. My town of Olivia, they went to MPCA standards four years ago and spent about $12 million, and now they're coming back, and now they're facing another $8 million. They aren't going to be able to afford that, so we're going to have to do that. As you hear these descriptions, uh, committee, understand that these dollar amounts that you hear are at least double what they probably should be. And what we're doing is, is we have standards. This is going to have to be heard in another committee. There are standards that the MPCA is placing on our small towns and asking the taxpayers to cover their projects because there's no possible way that these towns can do it. I've heard, I've heard examples of where people are suggesting that we shut down these small towns and have them move to other places because we don't want to fix their water. It's just completely absurd. And so I know that we have to have a rational conversation here on how we spend tens or even hundreds of millions of dollars on these projects, but we've got to rein this in. This is, this is not acceptable, the direction that we're going. We're just going to continue to spend this money and act like the MPCA just gets to do what they want. Uh, thank you, Representative Miller. And of course, that's the, the purpose of the bill is to try to do that. Uh, Representative Uglum. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and my questions are along that same line, uh, Representative Seifert. Um, <clears throat> you mentioned that, uh, that uh, we have much stricter standards than other states uh, that are in the region and much stricter standards than the uh, EPA has. Um, do you, has the Pollution Control Agency ever talked to you about why they do this and why they think they're better than the uh, EPA? Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, I have not specifically talked to them about that. There's always reasonings behind it. Um, we do chime in when they go through the rulemaking process. Keep in mind when you go through Chapter 14 rulemaking that the agency generally gets deference from the administrative law judges. You can say whatever you want, but you know you have the right to have your say, but not your way. And so you know they usually have rationale behind certain things. Each case is unique. Minnesota is a unique state, no doubt about that. Um, phosphorus tends to be an issue in the south. Mercury tends to be an issue in the north. Um, chloride more in the south. Um, we've got. Uh, the stricter limits, I know when EPA came out with some of their discussions with Missouri and Iowa were doing chloride, there was questions of why are we going to a much stricter standard. Some of these folks can talk about what, what cost drivers are, are going to be burdened on them. Um, but that's probably a question best asked by a member with an election certificate of the PCA versus a, a lowly citizen like myself. Mr. Chair. <laughs> Where's the Ulam? Yes, um, I have asked that question. So I'm asking you a leading question, I guess. Um, and uh, what about, to your knowledge, uh, when they come out and test and everything else, um, is there independent verification by someone like Barr or someone else, or is it just the Pollution Control Agency's test procedure that is used that says you're out of compliance? Representative Seifert. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Uglum, would you are you asking, are, is there an independent scientific peer review that's done? Or, no. No, or no. A, a look at the permit by someone else? Mr. Chair. Representative Uglum. What I'm asking is when these cities, uh, when their treatment facilities and things are found to be out of compliance, mm -hmm. uh, I'm assuming that that's the Pollution Control Agency that is telling our cities that. And my question is, is there independent verification from someone like Bar Engineering or someone else uh, to confirm the PCA's opinion? Uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, we have an organization. We actually, you know, I represent them as well. Uh, Messer, Minnesota uh, Environment and Economic Review Board that does permit reviews. Um, we have caught mistakes. Um, one was in Oatana where, you know, there's simply, there was math modeling errors. Uh, had they carried through with that permit, um, they would have been responsible for millions and millions of dollars of upgrade. <coughs> they took the mistake that was caught by Messerb, would we hire consultants to do a review? They went back and said, yep, we made a mistake. Oatana does not have to do this. And we saved a heck of a lot of money uh, by doing that permit review. But we are an organization that is membership driven. So when we do permit reviews, we do those for our members, which are maybe five to 10 a year at the most of the 45 to 50 members in our organization. So therefore, when you have 800 cities in, the, in Minnesota and you've got a variety of permits coming up outside the metro area, the ones that belong to MassServe are having these permit reviews done and we're catching it. For example, in Kelly City, they're not a MassServe member. They had no idea they could contest their permit. They had no idea they had um, the right to ask questions. They just said, well, the agency knows best. We're just going to go with this. Then they end up signing into permits they maybe shouldn't be signing into. And um, a lot of this is the cities need to know kind of what their rights are to contest permits and to have second looks to have MassServe take a look at their permit. They maybe wouldn't have signed on to what they signed on to at the time had they known the rights that they had. And I'm not a lawyer, but I just, you know, I pretend. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm looking forward to the testimony because it's, it's a huge problem. And, and uh, I think your analogy about us worrying about <coughs> pensions for the state of Minnesota versus some of the costs that we are going to be incurring here in the future also uh, is very accurate. And um, it's, it's going to be huge. So I'm looking forward to testimony. Thank you. Representative Hausman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, one question to the bill's author, and maybe you want to defer to staff, on lines um, 115 and 16, that phrase, and any other state or federal grant program for a single project, 
do do we have those identified or is that just what you wanting to cover the basis or what um, that particular phrase I might be able to help with that Reverend Cypress uh, thank you uh, mr. chairman represent Hosman that would be examples would be like um, uh, Department of Agriculture rural development oftentimes has dollars available um, former represent Finstead's now the, the head of that agency under the Trump administration so there are dollars from the federal government that flow in this bill would take that into account so they don't double dip so if you take federal um, PSAG money for example and you add that together and it gets up to 50 percent then they wouldn't qualify for the grant under this bill and then mr. chair if I could uh, and uh, probably represent Hansen should speak to this one but probably a little more context on this information sheet uh, that asks why should ratepayers in Greater Minnesota be limited to pay no more than twice what ratepayers in the metro area pay? Because of course, yes, we pay some fees, but we also pay uh, one heck of a lot of property taxes to do the same thing. There's a, a, a gentleman moving from St. Paul to a town in Greater Minnesota, and he tells me his property taxes will go down eleven thousand uh, dollars when he moves to that town. So uh, he's he's going to appreciate that. But I I don't know if you're going to speak to that at all but I think someone should perhaps put that in context a little bit and then um, what represent Seifert and represent Ugal might be happy to know about is that there's a bill moving through the process quickly in the house that nullifies these standards is, is that the represent wild, uh, mr. chair is that the wild rice bill yes okay yeah I was aware there's a bill that relates to this the, it's more the more of the northern part of the state impacted by that these folks are more southerners but um, I, I'm aware of that bill right oh, representative Hanson thank you mr. chair and you know I on sitting in environment committee a lot of the discussion here is deja vu um, in terms of the PCA bashing um, you know I've found in my experience here that most people don't want poop in their water and most people don't want their babies to turn blue kind of simple so why the question why which always gets asked why are we doing this people don't want poop in their water and they don't want their babies to turn blue so then we have to get to the how question how do we prevent this or how do we respond to this and I I have sympathy for the cities because I know in several of these cities or in the metro area we may be putting the effluent water back into surface water cleaner than the water that is receiving it. So why is that? Because that water is polluted. Right. And we rely on paying people to do the right thing to try to hope that that will get cleaned up. Where we require the cities, That's right. whether they're in rural Minnesota or in the urban area, we require people to do the right thing. We tax them. We tax them through the Met Council. We tax them through the property taxes. Uh, we don't get best management practices. My constituents don't get best management practices to fix stuff. They have to do it. And they get assessed for it even if they don't want to do it. So we're in a conundrum here because I, I feel the sympathy and we, I think we saw this when we were out on tour. You see the river go by and the river that the effluent, that the treated water is going into is dirtier. And the problem is, is that we have a multitude of locations that are up gradient of where the big cities and other cities are pulling water from surface water. Minneapolis and St. Paul drawing surface water from the Mississippi. So you have a bunch of your members upstream. And that's where we get into a variety of people trying to do the right thing because people don't want poop in their water and blue babies, among other things. So we keep, and you're right, the costs go up. The costs are going up for the cities. They go up for the Minneapolis taxpayer. They go up for the South St. Paul taxpayer. The Maplewood taxpayers pay for fixing this stuff, and they're having to chase those standards. But is it cleaning stuff up? So I would make the point that until we deal with nonpoint pollution, then we're not having a fairness issue and that you're cleaning up water and taxing small communities 
And my worry about this bill is you're taxing my community, your community, everybody else's community to clean up where we're already having to be taxed to pay our own community. That's not fair. So how do we deal with this? Litigation, I don't think, is the answer. But that's certainly where we keep going. Research. Um, somebody has to pay to clean up. Prevention is better than clean up. We're unwilling to do what it takes to prevent surface water from getting cleaned up. And until we do something there, then you're going to be back. All you guys are going to be back again. It's not fair for you to have to clean up your water to put it into streams that are dirtier than the water that you're putting into it. I don't have an answer for you. But I know that people don't want poop in their water or blue babies. So uh, I, I don't think this is the answer <coughs> because it's, again, shifting around who pays for the cleanup. And the cost continue to go up the longer we delay. Well, thank you, Representative Hansen. And you know, the, the purpose of doing this today is to basically have an open discussion about a very important issue. And I think one of our questions is, mm -hmm. uh, in light of what happens in some other states, uh, is there a cheaper way to successfully clean the poop out of the water? I think that's the essence of what we're talking about today. So with that, Representative Seifert. I'll turn over the test fire. I, I don't know that I actually disagree with Representative Hansen on a whole lot. I mean, she, Kelly will talk a little bit about the, the standard they have to face. Their wastewater has to be cleaner than their drinking water if they do what the PCA is telling them to do, unless I'm wrong. Um, she'll talk about that. So there's some kind of just common sense stuff that hopefully we can have a rational discussion on. You know, nobody's for blue babies and poop and water and all that. Um, I don't. I haven't heard of any blue babies in Iowa and Missouri, um, but you know, if we could look at what some of the other states have done, and maybe there's some proactive things. The PCA, I'll give them credit in a couple cases where there's some proactive alternative measurements they've done, um, and we're talking with them about ALASD up in Alexandria and some alternative uh, cleanup methods. That's the kind of stuff we need to get our arms around because it sailed out of committee unanimously in the Senate to authorize some of these creative things that we're gonna have to do. So for $600,000, they can do alternative management practices instead of a $14 million plan. And I think that's what we all got to start thinking that way. So I'll turn it over to Kelly. Uh, welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself. Thank you. I'm Kelly Rashi. I'm the clerk for the city of Lakefield in southwest Minnesota, population 1,691 people. In 2015, our wastewater permit required a reduced limit for phosphorus that needed immediate attention. The plant and the equipment is 30 years old and could not meet the phosphorus limits without modifications. This permit also included a significant compliance schedule requiring meeting SALTI parameter limits by November 2026. The limits we have to meet are chlorides, bicarbonates, hardness, and total dissolved solids. Our raw water from our wells does not meet the limits set in our wastewater permit. In Lakefield, according to PCA, you can drink our water, but you cannot flush our water. The current engineer's estimate to comply with the salty parameters include salty parameter schedule is $21.8 million. This is $4.1 million for the wastewater plant and $5.6 million for the water treatment plant because salty parameters cannot be dealt with at the, at the wastewater plant. We have to make modifications to our water plant. We also need to take every water softener out of all of the residences in the city of Lakefield. The final key to our project is addressing the inflow and infiltration issues in our sanitary sewer collection system. The estimated cost to address the INI issues is $11.6 million. Best case scenario for funding is the City of Lakefield gets 100% grant dollars for the project. Even with 100% grant dollars, according to the USDA affordability formula, our residents cannot afford to operate the modified plants. Our affordability is $103.26 per month average family unit 
which is $51.63 each for water and wastewater per month. With a 100% grant for the plant, the estimated average cost to operate those plants for water, it's $52.67 and $51.85 for $104.52. So even with 100% grant, we can't afford to operate our plants. If we receive no grant dollars, that would drive our rates to $89.26 for water and $92.59 for wastewater per month for a total of $181.85 per family unit. I believe this is nearly four times the rate paid in the metro area. Our potential funding sources include WIF, water infrastructure funding at $5 million, and PSIG, the point source implementation grant at $7 million, and USDA rural development. Using a guess, as we have not received funding information from USDA rural development, our preliminary engineering review is at USDA. Um, we submitted it in February of 2017, and we are waiting for our information from them is that we will get a 65% match of the balance. If that happens, our rates would need to be $65.49 for water and $69.56 for wastewater for a total of $135.05 per month, nearly three times the metro average. I'm here to support this bill because Lakefield has a need for funding assistance for projects of this magnitude. Lakefield residents currently pay $48 per month for water and $49 per month for wastewater, nearly twice the limit, twice the average of Metro already today without our project. Everyone in this great state supports clean water. Everyone should pay their fair share, paying more than twice the rates in the best case scenario because of where we live seems more than a fair share portion. Thank you. Thank you, and Ms. Rashi, maybe I missed it, but what is the, the total cost if you were to do everything? Per resident? No. Oh, uh, $21.8 million. All right, thank you. Representative Eklund. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ms. Ms. Rashi, um, when MPCA gave you the draft permit, did uh, the city try to question it or have it changed? We didn't know Ms. we Rashi. could. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, we didn't know we could. Um, we believe that they had our best interest at heart. At heart. Representative Hans. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would caution that the seven county metro area has a multitude of municipalities <coughs> that are very different. Very, very different. And so to lump all of us in as an average is not accurate nor fair, that some of our communities pay a great deal more than others and have to do the same stuff and have constituents do the same amount. So the average for the seven county, and I know from Representative Seifert that this is a common issue to, to frame everything as the evil metro that's getting a better deal. And there is a great deal of diversity in the seven county metro. And I'm frankly tired of constantly having this divisiveness of bashing the seven county metro area as always getting a better deal when every community is different in the seven county metro area. Every community is different. Next up. Mr. Chair, I think Glencoe is going to come up first, and um, we have um, actually two people from there, but I, I know it's Mark. You want both? We'll have both uh, folks come up. They're on, uh, they're on your agenda, Mr. Chair, so we have the uh, city councilman and city administrator. Okay. Thank you, Representative Seifert. First of all, is it true that the city of Glencoe was named after their state representative? No. <laughs> Just make it, there was a rumor. I wanted to get that clarified. Okay. Um, Welcome to the committee. All right. Thank you for taking time to listen to us today. My name is Mark Larson. I am the city administrator for the city of Glencoe. I've been the Glencoe city administrator for nearly 30 years. 
We have a population of 5,700 people and we're located about an hour west of Minneapolis St. Paul. We are the county seat of McLeod County. We are for, facing a huge dilemma. Our wastewater treatment facility, which was originally built in 1954, was upgraded in 1974 and then again in 1994, is requiring a $22.3 million upgrade to meet the limitations imposed in our most recent permit issued by the MPCA. Due to the aging condition of the existing plant, the city had no choice but to proceed with the upgrades or face penalties for violating our permit. We did initially uh, file a contested case with the MPCA, but again, our treatment plant's age and condition required us to move ahead. Our wastewater plant serves our neighboring community of Plato, Minnesota, population 320. Over two million of the cost of the improvements is for engineering expenses. Our city council has continually pressed our engineers to keep the cost down, but due to the mandates of the state, the costs continue to rise. Approximately $7 million of the plant upgrade is due to the cost of treating phosphorus. 80% of the cost of the phosphorus removal would be eligible uh, for funding from the PSIG program, approximately $5.6 million. The City of Glencoe is not eligible for any other additional grant dollars. We are not eligible for WIF. The City of Glencoe citizens will be responsible for the remaining $16.7 million. We are eligible for a low interest loan from Public Facilities Authority, but the citizens of Glencoe and Plato will be saddled with paying off this huge debt over the next 20 years. Our City Council reluctantly and recently approved a three year rate increase that will increase the average family's sanitary sewer bill from $33 per month to 62. That is assuming that we do get the state grant. If we don't get the state PSIG grant, rates will go higher. We have heavily invested in our public infrastructure on our own over the last four years to the tune of over $20 million. We have an additional $7 million improvement project in 2018 for a large stormwater project in Glencoe. The results of increased taxes, assessments, stormwater rates, and wastewater rates have been a lot for the citizens and businesses of Glencoe to bear. We are asking the state legislature and the governor to provide additional funding for public water projects uh, based upon capping our rates at twice the metro rate of $46 per month or providing funding for up to half of the improvements. Uh, bottom line is we need your help and I think there are about 300 other cities that are going to need your help also. I'd like to introduce uh, City Council, uh, Vice President of the City Council, Mylon Alexander. Welcome Mr. Alexander. Thank you sir, everyone for allowing me to speak. As Mark said, I'm Milan Alexander, the Vice President of City Council. I'm pretty, uh, this one? Yeah. I'm pretty new at this. I'm the new guy on the block actually. <clears throat> Been here about 16 months on the council. Before that I uh, had a long lengthy military career and I retired and I was talked into running and, and I won. So. <laughs> Uh, my wife says, oh boy. <laughs> I ran on a platform of uh, less spending because I, I listened to the general public and you know you have the naysayers that said, well, why are we building this? Why are we spending money on that? Well, we're going to get assessed from the 429 assessment. Uh, we can't afford this. And I was, oh, yeah, I'm going to stop that. But when I became a counselor and I got out and started looking around and seeing what we're doing and actually researching, looking at pictures, videos of the, uh, when, they, when they scope your pipes and how bad they were underground in the streets, I, I pretty much changed my attitude. Um, it's something that had to be done. And we've got probably half the town done now. Uh, up and running. We do have another project scheduled. Uh, it's our central corridor. We have a we have a bad flooding problem in the center of town. Uh, it floods a lot of homes out, and and that project will be coming soon. Um, I have I have a steep learning curve now in regards to the MPCA, the wastewater permits, and the wastewater limits and the cost of upgrading a wastewater treatment plant. Before that, I had no idea. Uh, as, as many people in a community, you read the newspaper, you see what the console's doing, you see, well, this rate or that might be going up. But now I know why. And we have committee meetings all the time. We meet with our engineers. We said 
$6.3 million for us in Plato to come in compliance with the mandated uh, levels of discharge that the MPCA has put on us. And we say to ourselves, my fellow counselors and I, we said, we can't afford this. What can we do? We cannot put this hit on our people. Our citizens of Glencoe, the ones that are already being assessed for their for the new roads, uh, streets, and infrastructure, and now we're gonna raise our stormwater rates to help pay for the new project coming up. Now we're raising our sewer rates, as Mark explained. I looked at my, my water, my bill I get, it's got my electric, my water, my sewer, and my storm sewer on it. And it's just my wife and I living there, and we, we figured it out, it's, uh, what was it, about 3,000 gallons a month. And we're basing our prices on 3000 a month. And I said, wow, we're going to have to cut back somehow, you know, get some rain barrels or something and start saving water. And uh, we just can't afford it. We've tried everything. We, we've researched it. We've talked to everybody we can. It seems that when I looked at the budget that was proposed by Governor Dayton, and he's proposed $542 million for the U of M and other colleges in the state. And then he proposed $458 million for parks and trails, and then another $10 million for Eagle Center in Wabasha. I'm thinking, whoa, you know, these cities can't afford what we have to do, what we're mandated to do. Can we, can we take some away from those other budgetary items, which I think are extreme, I don't know. Just, and put it towards the cities so we can accomplish what's been mandated for us to do. So we can build and get new equipment so we could uh, come in compliance. Um, we started now, starting next month, our first in a series of rate hikes for our citizens of Glencoe. And every year we're gonna raise it because we have to have enough money banked up for our first payments, right? And, uh, we were going to get $7 million pissing, but that's out the window. Part of our project, I guess, didn't qualify. So the MPCA said, well, we'll give you five point whatever. That's, that's a drop in a bucket. So I, I, I understand, Representative Hansen, where you're coming from, too, in the, in the first part of your questioning. Uh, uh, there, if anybody had a better idea, it'd be just great. I mean... <laughs> I don't know what else we can do. I, I doubt the MPCA is going to back down on their allotted, you know, uh, what can be discharged. I just don't think they put enough forethought into it when they mandated this to figure out we're, we're, the state's going to need a lot of money to help these cities out. Uh, our police chief even came and addressed us at one of our committees and said, he said, whoa, whoa, uh, these rates are, are horrible. I go out on calls, I meet with the d d disturbances, and, and the whole argument with these families is they're already at the limit. This is gonna push them over the top. They can't afford it, you know, and businesses. We, we're trying to attract businesses, not drive them away. I'm, I guess I'm just being passionate about this, but, and I do have a lot more to learn, but on this topic right here, we need help, and I guess that's all I have. Thank you again. Oh, thank you, uh, Councillor uh, Alexandri, uh, and certainly a lot of you know, important points, and I understand your questions, uh, but in fairness, I think we also should recognize that the governor put $167 million uh, into uh, his proposal uh, for Public Facilities Authority funding. Representative Seifert? Um, no, I, and I appreciate that. Like I said, uh, when we first introduced the bill, I, I think it's gonna, People who don't want to pay for bonding bills um, are going to have to come up with money, and people who don't want to change any regulations are probably going to have to move a little toward the middle, and everybody's going to have to give a little bit to make this work, because it's just not going to work if we we have to put money into this. A lot of this is aging infrastructure. It's not the regulation. So, um, Mr. Chair, my last testifier is uh, Chad Adams. Went to a great college, by the way, Southwest Minnesota State. Um, he's a city administrator in uh, Albert Lee, Minnesota and wants to talk about the extreme impacts that's gonna be on the rate payers and particularly I think, the, I think the fear we have in the border communities of losing businesses over this particular issue. So I'll just turn that over to him and he can talk a little bit about that. 
Welcome, uh, Mr. Adams. Please introduce yourself and, yes, proce Mr. and proceed. Yes, Mr. Chair, good afternoon, and uh, thank you to committee members. I am Chad Adams. I'm the uh, city manager for the city of Albert Lee. And as Representative Seifert has mentioned, um, Albert Lee was one of 15 volunteer cities that were analyzed by Bar Engineering um, a little over a year ago as part of the report commissioned by the state to look at future water and wastewater infrastructure costs in Minnesota. That report estimated that our community will need to undergo wastewater infrastructure upgrades estimated to cost $72.5 million. To meet this cost without state help, uh, our city's wastewater rates would have to rise dramatically. Uh, for example, uh, for commercial businesses and industries, which make up 61% of our wastewater use, the rates would double. Today, we've talked to, I should, I should say prior to this mandate um, being made, we've had a lot of conversations with our industries and the concerns about our current wastewater rates. As one of our examples uh, of a larger business, it would increase their annual bill from $204,000 a year to $408,000 a year. And if we get a current grant um, through the state of Minnesota of about up to $12 million, I'm going to put that in context in terms of what it would be per month. For this business, presently they pay about $17,000 a month. If it were to double, it would go to $34,000 a month. If we get current state funding up to that amount, if we're lucky, it would reduce their bill to about $28,500 per month. Not a significant decrease. That's why this bill is so important for our commercial businesses in Elberly. Again, this business and many others have expressed concern about our wastewater cost even prior to this mandate with the intent to relocate their industry across the border just 15 miles to the south in Iowa. <coughs> These upgrades would create an immediate economic crisis for our industries and communities. I'm also going to talk about the impact on our residential users. In addition, without state help, our residential rates would have to nearly triple to an average of $1,082 a year to break that down for a household per month. Right now, a residential household on average pays about $33 a month. And that would increase to $90 a month under this mandate. Again, if we were able to get up to $12 million in state assistance, that would reduce it down to $75 a month. Still, well than double what they're paying today. We recognize that the Metro is able to keep down costs lower because of the lower cost of serving a highly concentrated population. This is not an option for cities like Albert Lee and other smaller cities in greater Minnesota. Our cities in greater Minnesota are particularly hit hard by these, hard, by these high costs. And that's really why we need a benchmark, a limit to how much local homeowners and businesses can reasonably be expected to pay. We do believe it's reasonable and fair to set some parameters as to how much our citizens should have to pay particularly in a lot of greater Minnesota cities and as in Albert Lee, the vast majority of our citizens are below the median household income. So it's going to have a larger economic impact on those households and the businesses that are trying to grow. I'd also like to take a step back and talk about the history of our wastewater infrastructure. Back in the 1980s, we built a wastewater <coughs> treatment plant. Uh, that was built to serve the capacity of what was then known as our farmland or Wilson uh, meat packing plant. It was oversized uh, to meet the needs of that industry and that industry growing as well. As you know, in 2001, that meat packing plant burnt down. It did not rebuild in the community. This had a devastating impact on our economy. And it's taken 15 years for us to stabilize our economy and turn it around. We finally are turning our population and growth around. However, now we're faced with these mandates. And these costs will further and largely more decimate our economy and industry. Our city residents are not the main cause of water pollution, but the, the entire state does benefit from the clean water efforts that our cities take on. This is why we believe the state should play 
a larger role and share in the cost. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Representative Hausman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. To that very last point you made, what I heard you say is the citizens in your town aren't responsible for the pollution. Have you attempted to find out who is responsible and to, and to have that conversation? Uh, Mr. Adams. Yes, uh, Representative Hausman. We've uh, talked to a lot of different agencies. Um, you know, we believe um, that cities of our uh, size and other communities represent about 15% of the cause, and some may argue that's a little bit higher than that. But I think we believe, as all other communities do in the state of Minnesota, Metro and Greater Minnesota, um, that we all need to play and pay a share of these costs until everybody is controlling their point or non-point uh, sources of pollution. It's not going to benefit the water quality of the state of Minnesota. We can't have one uh, entity go first and wait decades or years for other entities. Uh, to be required to make mandates. There has to be a bigger picture, and we're asking the, we're asking the state of Minnesota and the state legislature uh, to find that balance. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just to follow up on that, so um, here's how my taxpayers would hear that. Um, so the, you didn't cause the pollution. Somebody did. Maybe we haven't figured that out yet, and we don't want to hold, you know, the polluter pays principle sounds good, but but we aren't pursuing that. So um, you would like uh, the Metro taxpayers to help pay uh, to continue to clean up what we continue to pollute? Does that, do you think um, that makes a lot of financial common sense? We, mm, we, we pay millions Halston, and millions. The Metro should be paying, rural Minnesota should be paying, greater Minnesota cities should be paying, agricultural should be paying everybody in the state of Minnesota that is contributing towards these sources of pollution that we should be paying a fair share to make sure that we have the water quality standards that this great state needs. I, I guess, Mr. Command. Chair, what I'm asking is uh, sometimes it's cheaper to prevent. I mean, shouldn't we be putting more efforts into prevention than to make everyone pay a huge bill? Mr. Adams. Representative Hausman, the, the city of Alberta has been one of the leaders throughout the state of Minnesota in preventing these sources of pollution. We've approved a local option sales tax that goes directly to water quality initiatives. And that's been in place for over 10 years. So we've been working with farmers. We've been working with our, our watershed district on stream bank restoration, shoreland buffers. So we believe that we're actually ahead of the curve compared to most uh, communities in the state of Minnesota, including a lot of metro communities. I worked in a metro community for eight years. They're also very passionate about water quality. Some cities aren't quite there yet, but there's others outside of municipalities and the metro that also need to step forward and be a part of these mandates and solutions in the future. We're all in this together. We will continue to include our water in Albert Lee, including our lakes, but we need partners as well in the future. And by tripling the cost for our homeowners, and doubling the cost for our businesses, that's not economical. Our businesses and our community will be decimated by this. They will jump to Iowa 15 miles away where there's not as many regulations and there's other advantages to go there. Um, we need competitive advantages, not only in Albert Lee, but all greater Minnesota cities who are seeing the very same situation. Representative Dean. Thank you, Mr. Chair. In you know, I'm sitting here and I'm, I'm trying to gather all of this because we are, you know, a state and, you know, we need to recognize that the economics are different in rural parts of the state than they are in urban parts of the state. And yet many of the, the infrastructure systems that have been in place, uh, a lot of people in the metro area have been dealing with updating their previous systems, you know, I mean, you know, it wasn't too long ago we put all our wastewater and our sewer water into the same pipe and our stormwater and it would all go into the river and we'd dump it there. Uh, you know, the, the movement around I&I &I is really, really critical uh, because the impact of that, if we don't do that, is much, much greater than paying the cost for what it, it, it is now. Um, I believe that there's a real need in the rural part of the state. 
Uh, I'm not 100% sure that I understand all the economics. I mean, clearly there are some non-point source pollution that's impacting that. And I think that a lot of the new standards in place um, are trying to address some of those issues. The, the thing that I think is really amazing is, you know, um, is about 25, 30 years ago, everybody was talking about oil and how crazy oil was. And I started having conversations with people about water. And I think we're starting to get to that point where water is now more important than oil. Uh, as we find new sources to generate energy, oil is not, um, is not going to be our future. But what good is our future if we don't have water that we can use to uh, water our crops, uh, to quench our thirst, and to help our systems work? At the same time, uh, we're doing things on a large, large global scale that are impacting all of those things as well. I understand that the state of Minnesota has to help all of you address these issues that are in place that are critical for all of you right now. I just hope that, 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 that many people in rural Minnesota realize that, you know, when we're reducing our costs for some of these issues, there are also other things that come into play, our costs around transit and other types of things. I mean, you don't know how many times, I've only been here six years, talking about what boondoggles light rail are uh, and that, you know, the state shouldn't have to pay for that. The local area should have to pay for that. So I, I, I think that this is a, a, something that we need to begin to connect these things and realize that what is critical for the survival of many of these rural parts of the state in some of these small towns are the urban areas have critical needs as well. Uh, and to keep the economic engine of our whole state, which you know we know that the metro area is a huge economic driver to our whole state, we need to take those in context of everything. So, so I'm not really speaking against this. Um, I, I think that we also need to continue to look at those ways in which we can do things differently that might be more cost effective. And Representative Seifert, you talked about that. And uh, I just think that the longer we let this go, we know the more expensive it's going to be. Uh, so the question is, we have the capacity to bond three and a half billion dollars. We could do all of this. <laughs> I, yeah, so, sorry. Uh, <laughs> So, but, but I mean, you know, that, that, that's one of the things that I, I think is really, really critical when we think about the size of the bonding bill and what we're going to be able to accomplish. Uh, so so I, I, I know that I was sort of on a soapbox a little bit, but, but I think that these are important things that need to be said. Uh, and I am not an uh, enemy of the rural part of the state. Uh, I'm actually a big fan of the rural part of the state, and I'd like to figure out how we make it so that we're not pitting the urban area and the rural area against each other. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Dean. I think you raised some good points. I mean, certainly, you know, we are one state, and I think we are discussing things today that, uh, you know, hopefully bring bring that uh, in, into focus. Uh, I don't think that, uh, you know, anyone who has testified today or anyone on this committee wants to see dirty water in Minnesota. You know, the question becomes, uh, what can we do the most cost effectively to make sure that we have clean water and meet the needs of the people of the state? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I just love the fact that you said cost effective and not cost efficient. I don't know if I misspoke or not. But <laughs> no, no, you said effective, Mr. Oh, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Representative Hansen. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I know that uh, Representative Lilly has donuts coming later, so I'll be very quick. Um, <laughs> Mr. Adams, and I, I understand, I grew up uh, in Freeborn, I understand and have watched with Albert Lee uh, the changes that have gone on, and I think actually my district has similarities with South St. Paul with closing the stockyards and 15 years and turning around 
we're 30 and 40 years and the changes are are difficult to turn things around from a one industry uh, business. And we have the same old infrastructure, the old pipe, the old streets, the old buildings. Um, I did have a constituent text me while we were in debate uh, from the city of West St. Paul. And I know that uh, the chair knows where West St. Paul is because we drove down Robert Street in West St. Paul. But uh, their sewer and water bill, and this is for uh, a senior couple in the city of West St. Paul for the combined water and sewer is $144.12 per month. Now, this month. And they could have an inflow infiltration requirement that may be eight to ten thousand dollars that they will not get any grant for, and because they're a city of in the metro area, they cannot apply for any of the rural development grants. So that's one resident with two seniors, not a high use, one hundred forty-four dollars and twelve cents today. So this is the context mm -hmm. that we we have to be able to walk in each other's shoes a little bit here <coughs> and understand uh, what current reality is and it's we're all going to be struggling with this as the pipes get older uh, I want to say one quick thing on Iowa you know the and I understand about moving across the border and the challenges are there but Iowa is going to have to face the reckoning at some point uh, the city of Des Moines Waterworks was going to sue up up gradient and the solution of the Iowa legislature was to eliminate the board of the Des Moines Waterworks that was their, how their legislature reacted, was to try to eliminate the people who were suing uh, the upgradient cities. I don't think we would be doing that unless someone's proposing getting rid of the PCA, but um, their water wars are coming. They will not avoid them. Uh, and I think we, we can provide uh, a different path. Hey, thank you, uh, Ribs Hansen. And, uh is that a hand up? Okay. We don't have any further testifiers. Okay. Mr. Chair, I know you said perhaps PF, PFA wanted to say something. But. Uh, yes, I would like to move to uh, Representative Lilly at least by 415. So uh, at this point, I believe that uh, Mr. Freeman wanted to speak against the chairman's bill. <laughs> Come on down. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I think you just took a page out of Greg David's book. <laughs> the name you know, the name you trust. Texas. <laughs> Welcome, Mr. Chairman. Hi. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Jeff Freeman. I'm the executive director of the Public Facilities Authority. Um, and I want to uh, express my opposition to this bill, which I believe would be bad policy and have a number of unintended consequences. Um, I can't speak to the appropriateness of water quality standards and treatment requirements, uh, but I very well understand the financial challenges that cities face to maintain their water infrastructure meet the requirements and, and provide the service to their residents. Um, and I can speak to, I think, the uh, issues regarding uh, the most effective and efficient ways of providing assistance to cities. Um, before getting into specific concerns, I'd like to just really quickly review the current framework uh, of PFA funding programs for water and wastewater infrastructure projects which include low interest loans and targeted grants based on affordability and water quality protection and restoration goals. Our largest program is the Clean Water Revolving Loan Fund. It provides low interest loans for all types and all sizes of projects. With interest rates currently less than one and a half percent, there's a, those loans provide significant interest savings to cities compared to market rate financing. Uh, as a revolving fund, the federal capitalization grants that go into those pro and the state match that's appropriated are long-term investments that provide significant leverage of, the state, of those funds. To date, each $1 of state funds 
uh, has appropriated or has supported $16 in project construction and $3 of interest savings for local taxpayers. The primary grant programs, as you've heard, are the the WIF grant program, which goes primarily to help cities replace aging infrastructure, and the Point Source Implementation Grant program that provides grants to help cities upgrade treatment uh, facilities when they are required to meet more stringent treatment requirements. Um, recognizing the significant challenges that cities face, last year the legislature approved changes to both of these programs that significantly increased the grant assistance that was available to cities and significantly increased the appropriations for those programs. With grants now provide up to 80% of project costs or up to a maximum of $5 million for high cost projects to help replace the aging infrastructure. The PSIC grants, Point Source Implementation Grants, pro now provide up to 80% and $7 million for costs related to meeting the more stringent treatment requirements. However, in all cases, there is a local share, and in that local share can be financed by the PFA low interest loan. Under the proposed bill, cities would essentially automatically receive a 50% grant, regardless of grant need or eligibility factors, and many cities would get 100% grant funding. The basic reality of wastewater treatment is that it simply costs more to provide wastewater service in some areas of the state than in others. Community size and characteristics is a big factor. Also geography, geology, hydrology, the nature of the receiving water, all of those things can significantly affect the cost of providing wastewater treatment in one city versus another. Unfortunately, and as you've heard, in many small communities, the, just the operation and maintenance costs and existing debt service costs can already put uh, uh, the system cost per household at more than twice the uh, metro average, which is just an average, as has been mentioned. Um, so for all of those cities, the bill would essentially guarantee a 100% grant for any new project in those communities. Taking away incentives to find cost savings, determine the most cost effective alternative, and figure out cheaper ways to do this. The bill would also have a very negative effect on our federal funding partner, USDA Rural Development which provides at least 30 to $40 million a year in low interest loans and grants for small rural communities. The PFA WIF program currently provides coal funding <coughs> with rural development for many small communities with the state grants added to the federal funds to meet the grant need based on rural development's required affordability criteria, similar to the state's affordability criteria. However, under this bill, State grants up to 100% with no calculation of affordability would lead cities to skipping the rural development application process altogether and just applying to the state, essentially putting rural development out of business, resulting in a significant loss of federal funds for Minnesota communities. This bill would be very expensive for the state, requiring state appropriations at much higher levels than currently requested. And it would establish an expectation by cities for these unsustainable higher grant amounts. If the expected funds were not appropriated on a continuing basis, cities would postpone their projects until the funds were available, putting us further and further behind in trying to address Minnesota's long-term water infrastructure needs. The key to meeting those long-term needs is for the state to provide consistent, sustainable funding effectively targeted to the greatest needs and provided in a predictable way that cities can have confidence in as they plan for their future projects. Last year, the legislature made program changes and appropriated significant funds uh, to put Minnesota on that path. And I urge you to continue that course. 
Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Freeman. And you know, I want to, uh, as I have in the past, commend you for the work that PFA has done, that you have done. Uh, you, know, it's, you have done some very admirable service uh, to the state uh, to help us meet a very significant problem. Um, the purpose of this today, uh, as I have said several times, was, is to focus attention on a, an issue that is very serious and is having a very big impact, uh, certainly on greater Minnesota, but on all of Minnesota. And we need to find a way to get this under control, uh, to, to get the cost under control. And uh, you know, we've continued the discussion along those lines today, and we need to find a way in the future to, to reach that goal so that we don't make it impossible for people to live in certain parts of the state. And uh, so with that, I guess we'll uh, conclude. Oh, Representative Officer Sock, yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just a couple of questions. Um, Representative Seifert, can, is this like a current all-in inventory of projects that are needed to be done in your, inside your membership, or what does this inventory serve? And is there, could I ask you if I can weigh on you then, a more comprehensive inventory? So as I sit here, and you've come to know me a little bit, I would love to see some sort of a reduction of our status across the state or any kind of an increment that's larger than what I suspect is only a minor percentage. Sure. Representative Seifert. Mr. Chairman, Representative Sock, the, the, the list that you have in your hand is the bar report synopsis of those communities that were surveyed and yep. they did an in-depth uh, analysis of. Um, the PFA, and I want to compliment Mr. Freeman, who is probably the best administrator in terms of his professionalism and knowledge and expertise on this than anybody I know, so I have no criticism of the PFA. Um, they have the list, I want to say, um, you update that, Jeff, probably every month um, or every day now because every legislator wants to know if their district's going to get help or not because I, I know how you guys think because I was one of you. Um, they want to know if you're going to qualify on the list depending on how much money Represent Verdahl finds when he, when he does you know, the, the governor's number plus uh, another 50 for this. You guys want to know if you're going to qualify or not. So um, Mr. Freeman has an a, a up-to-date list that he could provide for the committee on all of the um, different communities that are impacted, how much money they would qualify for, etc. And one thing I, I would quickly say um, is this bill can certainly change if we want communities to go through USDA first and then see how that's what the intention was, what they qualify for and then come to the state as the last resort. And I, I guess I would say if it's unsustainable for the state to pay for this, how can it be sustainable for Little Lakefield, Albert Lee, and Glencoe to pay for this? The state certainly has a bigger economy of scale than these little towns. So, you know, at some point we have to step back and ask ourselves, these little towns can afford this when it's unsustainable for the state? And so we, we have to start kind of asking ourselves the overall question, the cost drivers, the ability to pay, um, the metro thing can be dropped out and changed. That, that's not meant as a, a battering ram or anything against the metro. It's just kind of a, a baseline because we were struggling to try to figure out, like, what's a mechanism for affordability to qualify for these grants. So. Short answer, Representative Salk, because that was the bar report. Thank you. Representative Salk. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm struck to, cons to think that we're talking about something that has multiple disciplines and is not going to actually do anything productive until we have all of the elements of the factors that are needed. Now, as you all know, I'm a person of great naivety. And you can chuckle when I get done saying this, but I suspect there, and at least in my world, I like to sit down, analyze, develop a fact set, be able to put together all of the vectors of influence into something like this. This is not about the Capital Investment Committee. This problem is about multiple areas of concern across the state and I think we need to do that as much as we need to poke our eye in the bear just to make sure that the, he, he comes alive and starts to pay attention. So I, I think this did that, 
But I think that if we just let that pass and don't start to sit down and across our disciplines to find out who can add what and what would its impact be, that analysis is not that difficult. I mean, we got people sitting all over this, this complex who can come to an understanding of what elements would contribute what kind of benefit as we are approaching this fairly comprehensive problem. And I don't know, I am, like I said, I'm too young, well, no, wait, I'm, t I'm too old and too naive to be able to know where the pathway is. But I, I'm struck by the fact that we need more than just the 20 of us. Thank you, Representative Sock, and that's part of what you have been saying is what I've been trying to convey today and, and what our, our purpose is. Um, <clears throat> we do need to uh, move on to Representative Lilly now, but I just want to conclude by saying that I, I do believe that it's the intent of this committee to uh, put significant funding into the PFA for yeah. this next year. Representative Lilly. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Is this, is this new protocol we're adopting here? Yeah. They all come with donuts and cookies? Apparently. Lily does it right. Okay. <laughs> um, oh, no, I'm still I, I, I was rather inspired yesterday by the uh, Wait, Wait Park folks. They had kind of a pretty nice uh, visit when we uh, went through Wait Park, I remember. Remember their donuts? You, you were inspired by the Wait? <laughs> the Wait, <laughs> wait Park. <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, Representative Lilly, thank you for the uh, the uh, gifts to the committee, and uh, it's been a kind of a rough day for me in the treat category, but uh, I'm struggling through. Uh, we now have House File 3187 on uh, the Metro Parks, and. Uh, Representative Lilly, feel free to begin your presentation. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, um, House File uh, 3187, although I'm the author, is really uh, it's a, a bill for many, many members of this uh, a body that we all serve in. It's uh, um, it would include uh, um, I hate to bring up the word, but it's a Metro Park and Trail System after what we went through, but it's. Uh, um, I actually really enjoyed the discussion and, uh, and believe in a one Minnesota as well. Um, the, the bill that I, uh, I bring forward is uh, has basically it's 29 different projects around the metro and uh, uh, honestly uh, 16 of them are uh, in GOP districts and 13 are uh, in DFL districts. So it's across the board. Uh, we have uh, um, it's $15 million that we're asking for uh, for, the, for the Metro Parks uh, uh, system and uh, the and regional uh, metro wide system. Keep in mind that this system has, uh, you know, we're lucky we got our star staff, uh, Jenny uh, Nash. I was reading her report and I actually, I don't know where I saw it, but it was, I said, well, I saw it in her report, but I don't know where she got it, but she said, uh, uh, the Metro Regional System has more uh, than twice the visits in 2016 than uh, the Grand Canyon, Yellowstone, and Yosemite uh, combined. Um, so just to kind of give you the, the scale of the thing, um, I have a bunch of people in the crowd and we're not going to bring them all forward and being sensitive to the time. We lost a chair, I see. I don't know what to... What to I don't know what happened. I'm glad uh, Representative Ugum's taking over, though, so we're in good hands. Um, but uh, I don't know how to do this exactly, but we have uh, many uh, local, local uh, county uh, uh, officials out in the crowd. And maybe if you're willing to raise your hand, I know you don't want to, well, you might want to hear from each one of them, but uh, Anoka County, we have uh, Scott uh, Schulte. 
and uh, Mike uh, Comanche. Gamash. Gamash, sorry. Gamash. That's a good hockey name, I think. It is. <laughs> uh, Scott County, we've got, uh, <laughs> this is a good name too, uh, Mr. Beer. <laughs> That's one we could remember. Uh, Tom Wolf and uh, Dan Freeman. Is he, or maybe? From Three Rivers. Oh, from Three Rivers. I guess I jumped a, a line there. Washington County, Lisa White. Thank you. And then uh, Scott County, we have uh, uh, Barb uh, Weekman and Brecky. I'm not really as that great on those hyphen names. I'm learning. So, but thank you. We have a lot of uh, folks that have come. But I'm going to pass uh, um, this over to uh, um, Bob uh, or Bobo Carlson. Another Carlson. I don't know if we should have so many Carlsons in one room. But uh, um, he heads up the Three River system and is kind of leading the task on this. But there's, uh, you know, there's. Uh, Tons of counties here that we're not probably going to hear from, from Hennepin County and uh, Ramsey, but we're going to hear from some of Carver and from uh, Washington County. But uh, uh, appreciate your time today and kind of hearing, and um, I, we'll just get into the bill if that's okay. Very good. Very good. Uh, Mr. Carlson, a pleasure. Uh, introduce yourself to the, uh, to the committee for the record and give us your testimony. Mr. Chair, members, thank you. My name is Bo Carlson. I'm the superintendent of Three Rivers Park District. We represent suburban Hennepin County uh, within the Metropolitan Regional Park System. And I want to thank you on behalf of both our 10 implementing agencies within the metro area and our reflective board members that are both here today and not able to be here today uh, for the time that you're providing us to present this bill and for ultimately your consideration of House File 3187. We provided a handout that I think got around to everybody, but it'll be a PowerPoint presentation that we just thought we'd walk through some of the details of our proposal for you. So I know you've got with the treats and uh, beverage and now a handout. Hopefully you found where that is and we'll try to walk you through the details of what this proposal encompasses. Um, the Metropolitan Regional System was created by the state legislature back in 1974 and the intent was to protect land which together with state parks and trails will meet the recreational needs of the people of the metropolitan area. And that's essentially right out of statute. And the idea was really to serve as the regional or the state park system for the metropolitan area. So the state parks in greater Minnesota and then the regional parks and the metro would provide that same type of service or that same level of service. And when you look how it's been cited over the years, there's roughly about three state parks in the metro area. We have William O'Brien, uh, we have Afton State Park, and we've got Fort Snelling State Park, two of which are over probably better serving the residents of Wisconsin than they are in the seven county metro area. So a variety and most of the service that's being provided for state parks or recreation needs within the metro is being done by the regional parks agencies uh, throughout the system itself. And when you look at that, when you look at the state's population, there's about 54% of the population within the metro area. So we're serving a large audience, not only that audience, but then greater Minnesota as well that often come to our parks and are a part of those parks as well as people from out state. Uh, and when you look at the system, they're very well known facilities. Minneapolis Chain of Lakes, Como Zoo and Conservatory, Battle Creek Regional Park, Lake Minnetonka Regional Park, Rice Creek Chain of Lakes, Lebanon Hills, Lake Elmo Park Reserve, Spring Lake, Lake Waconia, uh, Bush Lake in Bloomington. These are all icons and well recognized names that you've probably been to been a part of, been there with your families over the long term. The regional park agencies are made up of the seven counties uh, within the metropolitan area uh, and the three cities of Minneapolis, St. Paul, and Bloomington. Um, three Rivers Park District represents suburban Hennepin County, so that's where the county relationship comes there. But this is the system as a whole. And if you flip to slide four, the regional park system itself consists of 54 regional parks within the system. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, and that's a great stat to have the visitation as it compares to some national parks that are out there, but we had 48 million visits last year. Uh, that is second only to the Mall of America as far as visitation within the state of Minnesota. Um, so it's a significant amount, and in many cases for a lot of our <laughs> systems, it's a matter of we're being loved to death. The folks that are out there using these parks on a regular basis, our infrastructure takes a beating, whether that's roads and trails or our campgrounds or our playgrounds. Um, it's seeing a lot of use, it's seeing a lot of activity that's out there. We encompass 56,000 acres of parkland. 
and we have about 400 miles of regional trail, enough trail to extend from Minneapolis to Chicago if you laid all those trails end to end throughout the system. So it's a sizable system, and it's important to recognize that this is not a local park system. This is the regional park system, and there are standards in which we have to abide by to meet that regional qualification. Uh, we have to have parks uh, that are park reserves that are a minimum of 1,000 acres in size, and we have regional parks that at a minimum have to be 200 acres in size. We need to serve 40% of a non-local population. So for instance, in suburban Hennepin County, 40% of our visitation needs to come from outside of our tax base that is then recreating within our facilities. And the idea is that we're crossing boundaries, we're crossing geographies to recreate in these facilities. And again, as I mentioned, some of those iconic parks and locations, you can certainly sense that folks that go to Chain of Lakes, that go to Como Zoo, that come down to Highland Bush, Anderson Lake Park Reserve, are all crossing those boundaries to seek out those parks and seek out those recreational opportunities. So what is this? What's this proposal in uh, total? And what it is is $15 million from the state of Minnesota, which will get 29 capital improvement projects throughout the metro area. This isn't one project. This is 29 projects throughout the seven-county metro. And what's important to recognize within these projects is they're locally approved. We're represented by local units of government. We're all represented by elected boards, elected officials that make priorities, determine priorities with our own capital improvement programs, and in many cases set our own levies and set our own bonding amounts uh, that ultimately support the operations and maintenance of these facilities themselves, and in some cases provide additional funding for additional capital needs that we might ultimately have. It creates jobs. These are local practitioners that are out there. These are local <laughs> contractors that are out there that are building these trails, building these playgrounds. It's local consultants that are assisting with, with design work, um, with other elements of it. So it very much is a jobs creator uh, within the metro and outside of the metro for that matter as well as we look regionally in some of the facilities that we're developing and the unique facilities that are out there. We serve a very diverse audience when you look at the population, certainly of the metro and all the folks that come from all over the state to recreate in our facilities, and we're preserving park assets, and that's really critical. These are critical park infrastructure components that not only provide the park services, but the spectrum of recreation opportunities that we want to provide to serve our growing uh, metro area, and again, state of Minnesota, that we recognize that there's additional needs there's additional demand that A, we have to keep up with to make sure that we have quality facilities that are out there. And B, meet and recognize that there's growing needs and recreational opportunities as our population ages, as families expand in numbers, as new populations come to the metropolitan area, we have to look at new ways to reach out to them and get them outdoors, get them living healthy lifestyles, get them living active lifestyles as they go forward. What's also critical within this in our system, and especially within the metro regional system, it's protecting and improving our environment. Uh, these facilities are natural resource based. When you look at park reserves, as I mentioned before, we have a minimum of about 1,000 acres in size. 80% of that land is kept in its natural state and protected for future generations. So when you look at the number of park reserves we have in the system and you think of the, all those acres that are untouched, uh, but yet still manage from a natural resources perspective, whether that's dealing with AIS, whether it's dealing with other invasives, it's all management efforts that we have to do, but it is for future generations. So there's an impact not only today, but for many generations to come as we go into the future. If you flip to slide six, um, we have kind of a map that shows the geography of these projects as a whole and the locations where they're at. Uh, again, 29 projects throughout the area. This is building bike trails, bridges, acquiring land, preserving buildings through repairs, uh, replacing worn infrastructure, as well as a variety of natural resource initiatives that we have. If you flip to page seven, uh, we have a total project list, and I recognize this is extremely difficult to read and probably in fine detail, but we wanted to take just a minute and go through county by county or agency by agency uh, the actual projects that you have a better understanding of what encompasses within this system. And with that, I'll turn it over to Jeff Perry from Anoka County Parks who can start talking a little bit about their initiatives. Welcome, Mr. Perry. Identify yourself, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Jeff Perry. I'm the Park Planning and Resources Manager for Anoka County. And what I'll do is I'll go through alphabetically the first five agencies and those respective projects. 
Uh, first of all, starting with Anoka County, there are eight projects uh, included in House File 3187, and I'll just give you a really quick overview of those projects, what the dollar amount is, and who the representative is uh, in that particular district. Uh, first of all, uh, Project 1 is to reconstruct one mile of entrance road and a new bike lane into the busiest nature one of the busiest nature centers in the metro area, Wargo Nature Center. And that is for $870,000 in Representative Runbeck's district. Uh, project 2 is to complete one and a half miles of missing regional trail links along the Mississippi River Trail in the cities of Anoka and Ramsey. That's in the amount of $340,000 in Representative Whalen's district. Project 3 in Anoka County is to replace the windows and roof at the Coon Rapids Dam Visitor Center, which uh, is nearing the, life, uh, nearing the end of its life cycle. It's 40 years old. And uh, that project is uh, in the amount of $320,000 in Representative Hortman's district. The fourth project is to remodel uh, one of the oldest restrooms in the Anoka County Park System, uh, located along Rice Creek West Regional Trail that was acquired back in the late 1970s. That project is for $260,000 in Representative Bernardi's district. Project 5 is to build a new grade separated accessible pedestrian bridge over I-35W in the Lionel Lakes area as part of a regional trail connection and that's $250,000 in Representative Runbeck's district. The sixth project is to complete a half mile trail gap along Coon Creek Regional Trail in Coon Rapids that connects two major regional parks together and that project is in the amount of $175,000 in Representative Portman's district. <coughs> uh, project seven is to provide a great separated pedestrian underpass along central Anoka County Regional Trail that results in a safer and more accessible uh, connection to Bunker Hills Regional Trail off of a regional trail. Crosses under a, a very major uh, county highway. That project is in the amount of $165,000 in Representative Scott's district. And then finally in Anoka County, project number eight is to replace a 22-year-old playground at Rum River Central Regional Park, uh, to replace it with an accessible playground. And that uh, is also in Representative Scott's district. So that concludes uh, Anoka County's projects. Moving on to the city of Bloomington. The city of Bloomington uh, has some trail re reconstruction at Highland Bush Anderson Lakes Park Reserve, and that is in the amount of $614,000 in Representative Rosenthal's district. Uh, moving along to Carver County in the Southwest Metro, uh, there's a land acquisition project for Lake Waconia Regional Park in the amount of $705,000 in Representative Nash's district. Um, down in Dakota County, there are two projects, two important uh, master plan improvement projects. One is at Whitetail Woods in the amount of 1.92 million in um, Representative Garofalo's district. And then lastly for Dakota County, Lake Billadsby Regional Park, uh, there's master plan improvements there as well in the amount of $630,000 in Representative Garofalo's district. And then uh, lastly, uh, for Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board, there's three projects, three very important projects. First of which is uh, the waterworks at Central Mississippi Riverfront Regional Park get to the tune of $2.285 million in Representative Dean's district. Uh, secondly, um, there's uh, a project to create Halls Island and the park on the Shear site in Minneapolis uh, for $1.699 million in uh, Representative Loeffler's district. And finally, in Minneapolis, uh, there's some master plan implementation facility improvement projects going on at uh, Mississippi Gorge Regional Park. With that said, Mr. Chair uh, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. And I can assure you that not only Anoka County, but the, my colleagues across all of the implementing agencies stand ready to, uh, to implement these projects. And uh, at this point, I'd like to turn it over to my colleague uh, to my left, uh, the director of Washington County Parks, Ms. Brewer, who will summarize the, the final five agency projects. Okay, thank you. Please identify yourself. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Sandy Brewer, and I'm the Parks Director with Washington County. I'll wrap up the rest of the presentation. Um, starting with Ramsey County, we have Long Lake Regional Park. This is a phase site and infrastructure improvements 
for the tune of $1.983 million in Representative Bernardi's um, district. Um, next, moving on to St. Paul, we have the Phelan Keller Regional Park. It's a transportation study implementation, phase one, 1.59 million in districts Fisher and Mahoney's districts. Second project they have is Como Regional Park Zoo and Conservatory for transportation improvements, 1.1 million in uh, Representative Leach, Leach District. Lech. Lech. Thank you for the correction. And if I, I apologize in advance if I botch any of those moving further, forward. Harriet Island to the South St. Paul Regional Trail, um, Robert Parham Regional Trail Connection Bridge to the tune of $700,000 in Representative Mahoney's District. Mariani. Man, will someone take over for me? <laughs> um, Scott County, Spring Lake Regional Park, Phase 1, Lakefront Development and Picnicking, Fishing and Trail Support Infrastructure, $532,000 in Tony Albright's district. Good. Doyle Kenflick <laughs> Regional Park Reimbursement, $355,000 in Vogel's district. Moving on to Three Rivers Park District, where we have uh, four projects scheduled for Silverwood Special Recreation Feature, and that's an acquisition reimbursement for $2,197,000. That's in Kunish Podine's district. Lake Minnetonka Regional Park, Pavement Rehabilitation of Parks and Trails. That's $1,613,000 in Hurtas district. Single Creek Regional Trail, which is a bituminous work on the trail, 932,000 in shared districts of Nelson, Hillstrom, and Hortman. And lastly, for Three Rivers Park District, we have Baker Park Reserve, design and reconstruction of a creative play area for 750,000 in Hurtas districts. And now the county that I can speak most intelligently to is Washington County, where we have four projects up. Three of them are in the Lake Elmo Park Reserve, which is Lomar, Lomar's district. Um, the first one is a Eagle Point Trail Access. These are access improvements with, which include a gate on the west side entryway of the park, as well as a small parking lot, and that will provide for people to enter into that um, large park from that side of the area. This is our most popular trail in Lake Elmo, and as Bo alluded to earlier, this trail is loved to death. Um, the second project at Lake Elmo is our swim pond. Um, this would include upgrades to our restroom, our maintenance and concession facilities, and design and construct a picnic shelter area. Also at Lake Elmo, we have a playground area improvements. This playground is over 20 years old and is in need of replacement, so this would include ADA accessibility, grading, and replacing the equipment itself. And then lastly, the fourth project for Washington County is the St. Croix Bluffs Regional Park Maintenance Building Improvements, 167,000, and that's in Jurgens District. Um, although that's not a beautiful, glamorous project, we do need a storage building to provide opportunities to size our facility. We're storing equipment outside, and we want to maintain that equipment as well as um, extend the life of that equipment. So in summary, we're here today representing the Metropolitan Regional Park System and asking for $15 million for our 29 projects. This would accommodate or allow us the ability to serve the 48 million residents that visit our park system. And we are all here to address any questions that you have. I'd also like to point out that we have representatives here from each of the 10 implementing agencies if you have a question directly related to a project. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Brewer. Uh, Representative Detmer. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, Representative Lilly, where is your project? <laughs> um, Representative Lilly. Mr. Chair and Representative Detmer, actually, when I started, it's it's really true, but uh, that it, none of this goes in my district. I don't have anything, but, uh, you know, I was, as you were going through the Dakota, Dakota County list, uh, one of my favorite things to do is to hop on a mountain bike and hit Lebanon Trail. So and that's common what we're hearing is that, you know, you, they don't know the political borders. They don't know the borders that we all know as legislators and city council people or county commissioners. People, you know, hop in their car and go for a walk around the lakes or they'll go on to, of course, like I said, the uh, Lebanon Hills, which I just love. 
and uh, you know, just on and on, or come to your district and hit the river, or, you know, and, and certainly uh, Lake Elmo Park Reserve. What a, I know you've been there. What a treasure. But anyways, thank you, and Mr. Chair. Just Not just a just to follow up in in the presentation. I, I think I heard one time ADA. Are all of these parks ADA accessible? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Representative Hausman. Just to just to be clear, Mr. Chair, and uh, the answer really? was yes, they are handicap accessible. So it's for the record. I just want to make sure Thank people you. hear that. Representative Hausman. Um, Mr. Chair, uh, one of the other statistics that Ms. Nash identified was that 45 percent of the visitors, who 45 uh, percent of of those 48 million live outside of the jurisdiction of the seven county metro area. So we we also share with a, a broader group. The um, interesting thing about to have broken this down by uh, by member and area. Very often, uh, suburban legislators feel they vote for the bonding bill, but uh, very little in bonding, a billion dollar bonding bill ever goes there. The exceptions to that are higher ed campuses, transit corridors, and as you see here, metro parks. And uh, so I, I thought I appreciated your actually going through project by project to, to demonstrate that. Representative Carlson. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, uh, I don't directly have a project um, on the list either. My name didn't come up uh, other than at the front table by coincidence, but um, I've always been a tr strong supporter of the parks, and I was just going to comment um, my father always used to say if you want a strong if you want strong communities, you've got to make sure you've got good jobs, good schools, and parks. And two of the homes that um, my parents had when I was growing up were both located close to a park. They happened to be city parks in both instances. One was in South Minneapolis, and then they later years bought a, a home in Bloomington. And uh, after my mother passed away and we were selling um, their home, which was the second one that they had close to a park, the number of people that would go through when we were selling that house, oh, it's close to the park. You know, and that became a, a real selling point. And my point is that all of that uh, influences a community and the strength of a uh, community. Now, in our family, there were five kids, and so uh, that also drove part of my father's reasoning to be close to a park. I suppose that meant a little less wear and tear on his lawn or whatever, but uh, at any rate, uh, I totally agree with the position that he would take, you know, good jobs, good schools, and good parks. Now, the other day, uh, we had a chance to visit with some of these same folks, uh, some of us from the metro area, and I asked about the relationship of schools. So two out of the three points on my list there, um, there's a tie with the schools as well. And uh, the answer to the question that I asked was what was the relationship to the local school districts? And I won't ask them to repeat it other than they pointed out that there's heavy usage in these parks for a variety of reasons by the various schools. Uh, some of it's their athletic team, some of it's the close proximity for usage and so on. So um, I became a, actually I went on here late as a co-author, so even though I don't have one in my district, uh, I think it's a good bill and one that uh, I hope we can move forward with. Now the one other thing I was going to mention, I don't think you used the match number. You talked about the number of projects, unless I missed it. But that $15 million investment, I think you said uh, yesterday or the day before, generates about $45 million in, uh, in overall uh, spending and improvements to the parks. So I think that's an important point for the committee to keep in mind as well. But thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative Carlson. I think uh, seeing no other questions. Oh, Representative Jurgens. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I do have a project in my district on here, but I think it's one of the smallest projects. <laughs> <laughs> and even though, uh, as Ms. Brewer said, it's just a maintenance building, I have every indication it would be a really fine maintenance <laughs> building. Uh, but I just want to speak in favor of this bill. And, and Representative Carlson touched on what I wanted to say, too, and that's the matching, that a $15 million bonding uh, investment would result in $51 million worth of spending. And I think that the regional park system is important. I think the state park system is also important. And those are being funded uh, separately from this. So I think that um, as we fund the state parks around the state of Minnesota, we, we need to also fund and invest in the regional parks in the metro area as well. Thank you.
Okay, thank you, Representative Jurgens, and uh, I'd like to uh, thank all the members today for, I think, a, a very good session and some good discussion. And uh, with that, in the words of Sergeant Preston, well, King, this case is closed. Thank <laughs> you.